Chapter Ten of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Greg Marguerite. This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch. Chapter Ten. Harry Collins, twenty thirty two. Harry's son's house was on the outskirts of Washington, near what had once been called Gettysburg. Harry was surprised to find that it was a house, and a rather large one, despite the fact that almost all the furniture had been scaled down proportionately to fit the needs of a man three feet high. But then Harry was growing accustomed to surprises. He found a room of his own, ready and waiting on the second floor. Here the furniture was of almost antique vintage, but adequate in size, and here, in an atmosphere of unaccustomed comfort, he could talk. So you're a physician, eh? Harry gazed down into the diminutive face, striving to accept the fact that he was speaking to a mature adult, his own son, his and Sue's, a grown man and a doctor. It seemed incredible, but then nothing was more incredible than the knowledge that he was actually here in his child's home. We're all specialists in one field or another, his son explained. Every one of us born and surviving during the early experimental period received our schooling under a plan Leffingwell set up. It was part of his conditional agreement that we become wards of the state. He knew the time might come when we'd be needed. But why wasn't all this done openly? You know the answer to that. There was no way of educating us under the prevailing system, and there was always a danger we might be singled out as freaks who must be destroyed, particularly in those early years. So Leffingwell relied on secrecy, just as he did during his experimentation period. You know how you felt about that. You believed innocent people were being murdered. Would you have listened to his explanations, accepted the facts that his work was worth the cost of a few lives so that future billions of human beings might be saved? No. There was no time for explanation or indoctrination. Leffingwell chose concealment. Yes, Harry sighed. I understand that better now, I think, but I couldn't see it then when I tried to kill him. He flushed and I still can't quite comprehend why he spared me after that attempt. Because he wasn't the monster you thought him to be. When I pleaded with him, you were the one? Harry's son turned away. Yes. When I was told who you really were, I went to him. But I was only a child, remember that, and he didn't spare you out of sentimentality. He had a purpose. A purpose in sending me to prison, letting me rot all these years, while— While I grew up. I and others like myself, and while the world outside changed." Harry's son smiled. Your friend Richard Wade was right, you know. He guessed a great deal of the truth. Leffingwell and Manshoff and the rest of their associates deliberately set out to assemble a select group of nonconformists, men of specialized talents and outlooks. There were over three hundred of you at Stark Falls. Richard Wade knew why. And so he was dragged off and murdered? Murdered? No, father, he's very much alive, I assure you. In, in fact, he'll be here tonight. But why was he taken away so abruptly, without any warning? He was needed. There was a crisis when Dr. Leffingwell died. Harry's son sighed. You didn't know about that, did you? There's so much for you to learn. But I'll let him tell you himself when you see him this evening. Richard Wade told him, and so did William Chang, and Lars Nielstrom, and all the others. During the ensuing weeks, Harry saw each of them again, but Wade's explanation was sufficient. I was right, he said. There was no underground when we were at Stark Falls. What I didn't realize, though, was that there was an overground. Overground? You might call it that. Leffingwell and his staff formed the nucleus. They foresaw the social crisis which lay ahead. When the world became physically divided into the tall and the short, the young and the old, they knew there'd be a need of individuality then, and they did create a stockpile. A stockpile of the younger generation, specially educated. A stockpile of the older generation, carefully selected. We conspicuous rebels were incarcerated and given an opportunity to think the problem through, with limited contact with one another's viewpoints. But why weren't we told the truth at the beginning, allowed to meet face to face and make some sensible plans for the future? Harry's son interrupted. Because Dr. Leffingwell realized this would defeat the ultimate purpose. You'd have formed your own in-group as prisoners, dedicated to your own welfare. There'd be emotional ties. I still don't know what you're talking about. What are we supposed to prepare for now? Richard Wade shrugged. 
Leffingwell had it all planned. He foresaw that when the first generation of yardsticks, that's what they call themselves, you know, came of age, there'd be social unrest. The young people would want to take over, and the older generation would try to remain in positions of power. It was his belief that tensions could be alleviated only by proper leadership on both sides. He himself had an important voice in government circles. He set up an arrangement whereby a certain number of posts would be assigned to people of his choice, both young and old. Similarly, in the various professions there'd be room for appointees he'd select. Given a year or two of training, Leffingwell felt that we'd be ready for these positions. Young men like your son would be placed in key spots where their influence would be helpful with the yardsticks. Older men such as yourself would go into other assignments, in communications media chiefly. The skillful use of group psychological techniques could avert open clashes. He predicted a danger period lasting about twenty years, roughly from 2030 to 2050. Once we weathered that span, equilibrium would be regained, as a second and third generation came along and the elders became a small minority. If we did our work well and eliminated the sources of prejudice, friction, and hostility, the transition could be made. The overground in governmental circles would finance us. This was Leffingwell's plan, his dream. You speak in the past tense, Harry said. Yes, Wade's voice was harsh. Because Leffingwell is dead of cerebral hemorrhage, and his plan died with him. Oh, we still have some connections in government, enough to get men like yourself out of Stark Falls. But things have moved too swiftly. The yardsticks are already on the march. The people in power, even those we relied upon, are getting frightened. They can't see that there's time left to train us to take over, and frankly I'm afraid most of them have no inclination to give up their present power. They intend to use force. But you talk as though the yardsticks were united. They are uniting, and swiftly. Remember the naturalists? Harry nodded slowly. I was one once, or I thought I was. You were a liberal. I'm talking about the new naturalists, the ones bent on actual revolution. Revolution? That's the word, and that's the situation. It's coming to a head fast. And how will we prevent it? I don't know. Harry's son stared up at him. Most of us believe it's too late to prevent it. Our immediate problem will be survival. The naturalists want control for themselves. The yardsticks intend to destroy the power of the older generation, and we feel that if matters come to a head soon, the government itself may turn on us, too. They'll have to. In other words, Harry said, we stand alone. Fall alone, more likely, Wade corrected. How many of us are there? About six hundred, said Harry's son, located in private homes throughout this eastern area. If there's violence, we don't have a chance of controlling the situation. But we can survive, as I see it. That's our only salvation at the moment, to somehow survive the coming conflict. Then perhaps we can find a way to function as Leffingwell planned. We'll never survive here. They'll use every conceivable weapon. Since there's no open break with the government yet, we could still presumably arrange for transportation facilities. To where? Some spot in which we could weather the storm. What about Leffingwell's old hideout? The units are still standing, Harry's son nodded. Yes, that's a possibility, but what about food? Grizzik. What? Friend of mine, Harry told him. Look, we're going to have to work fast, and yet we've got to do it in a way that won't attract any attention not even from the government. I suggest we set up an organizing committee and make plans." He frowned. How much time do you think we have? A year or so? Six months, his son hazarded. Four at most, Wade said. Haven't you been getting the full reports on those riots? Pretty soon they'll declare a state of national emergency and then nobody will be going anywhere. All right, Harry Collins grinned. We'll do it in four months. Actually, as it worked out, they did it in just a day or so under three. Five hundred and forty-two men moved by Jetter to Colorado Springs, thence by helicopter to the Canyon Hideaway. They moved in small groups, a few each week. Harry himself had already established the liaison system, and he was based at Grizzick's ranch. Grizzick was dead, but Bassett and Tom Lowry remained, and they cooperated. Food would be ready for the copters that came out of the canyon. The canyon installation itself was deserted, and the only problem it presented was one of rehabilitation. The first contingent took over. The jetters carried more than their human cargo. They were filled with equipment of all sorts. 
microscans and laboratory instruments and devices for communication. By the time the entire group was assembled, they had the necessary implementation for study and research. It was a well-conceived and well-executed operation. To his surprise, Harry found himself acting as the leader of the expedition, and he continued in this capacity after they were established. The irony of the situation did not escape him. To all intents and purposes, he was now ruling the very domain in which he had once languished as a prisoner. But with Wade and Chang and the others, he set up a provisional system which worked out very well, and proved very helpful once the news reached them that open revolt had begun in the world outside. A battered copter landed one evening at dusk, and the wounded pilot poured out his message, then his life's blood. Angelisco was gone. Washington was gone. The naturalists had struck, using the old outlawed weapons, and it was the same abroad according to the few garbled reports thereafter obtainable only via ancient shortwave devices. From then on nobody left the canyon except on weekly copter lifts to the ranch grazing lands for fresh supplies. Fortunately that area was undisturbed, and so were its laconic occupants. They neither knew nor cared what went on in the world outside what cities were reported destroyed, what forces triumphed or went down into defeat, what activity or radioactivity prevailed. Life in the canyon flowed on, more peacefully than the river cleaving its center. There was much to do and much to learn. It was actually a monastic existence, compounded of frugality, abstinence, constinence, and devotion to scholarly pursuits. Within a year gardens flourished. Within two years herds grazed the grassy slopes. Within three years cloth was being woven on looms in the ancient way, and most of the homespun arts of an agrarian society had been revived. Men fell sick and men died, but the survivors lived in amity. Harry Collins celebrated his sixtieth birthday as the equivalent of a second-year student of medicine, his instructor being his own son. Everyone was studying some subject, acquiring some new skill. One-time rebellious natures and one-time biological oddities alike were united by the common bond of intellectual curiosity. It was, however, no utopia. Some of the younger men wanted women, and there were no women. Some were irked by confinement and wandered off. Three of the fleet of eleven copters were stolen by groups of malcontents. From time to time there would be a serious quarrel. Six men were murdered. The population dwindled to four hundred and twenty. But there was progress in the main. Eventually Banning joined the group from the ranch, and under his guidance the study system was formalized. Attempts were made to project the future situation, to prepare for the day when it would be possible to venture safely into the outside world once again and utilize newly won abilities. Nobody could predict when that would be, nor what kind of world would await their coming. By the time the fifth year had passed, even short-wave reports had long since ceased. Rumors persisted that radioactive contamination was widespread, that the population had been virtually decimated, that the government had fallen, that the naturalists had set up their own reign only to fall victim to internal strife. But one thing is certain, Harry Collins told his companions as they assembled in the usual monthly meeting on the grounds before the old headquarters building one afternoon in July. The fighting will end soon. If we hear nothing more within the next few months, we'll send out observation parties. Once we determine the exact situation, we can plan accordingly. The world is going to need what we can give. It will use what we have learned. It will accept our aid. One of these days, and he went on to outline a carefully calculated program of making contact with the powers that be, or might be. It sounded logical, and even the chronic grumblers and habitual pessimists in the group were encouraged. If at times they felt the situation fantastic and the hope forlorn, they were heartened now. Richard Wade summed it up succinctly afterwards in a private conversation with Harry. It isn't going to be easy, he said. In the old science fiction yarns I used to write, a group like this would have been able to prevent the revolution. At the very least it would decide who won if fighting actually broke out. But in reality, we were too late to forestall revolt, and we couldn't win the war no matter on whose side we fought. There's just one job we're equipped for, and that's to win the peace. I don't mean we'll step out of here and take over the world, either. We'll have to move slowly and cautiously, dispersing in little groups of five or six all over the country. And we'll have to sound out men in the communities we go to, find those who are willing to learn and willing to build. But we can be an influence, and an important one. 
We have the knowledge and the skill. We may not be chosen to lead, but we can teach the leaders, and that's important." Harry smiled in agreement. They did have something to offer, and surely it would be recognized, even if the naturalists had won, even if the entire country had sunk into semi-barbarism. No use anticipating such problems now. Wait until fall came. Then they'd reconnoiter and find out. Wait until fall. It was a wise decision, but one which ignored a single important fact. The naturalists didn't wait until fall to conduct their reconnaissance. They came over the canyon that very night, a large group of them in a large jetter, and they dropped a large bomb. End of Chapter 10 of This Crowded Earth by Robert Bloch